Share with you. Okay, so tonight we're looking at kind of nest box neighbors, fauna that are relying on hollows and how to help them out effectively. We understand that in Australia, conditions have changed over the last couple of hundred years uh, since uh, European settlement. And we're in ever developing suburbs, ever expanding urban growth zones, et cetera. And we're trying to share that with the biodiversity that live in our neighborhood as well as trying to encourage some of the biodiversity so that the fauna, particularly the plants that were there to um, re-emerge into the community to bring them back as best we can. Okay, so we've got, um, so the first thing about is trees. So we, Nilambik in, and the people who live in Nilambik are blessed the fact that it's a, it's a well tree environment um I would, you know it's and that's the you know obviously the reason why a lot of people live within the in the council in the within the shire and other peri-urban shires particularly on the eastern side of melbourne where trees are a dominant part of the landscape so they provide many services to to your environment so these could include a food source for fauna whether it be leaves and are probably the most famous leaf, gum leaf eating um, critter is, a, is the koala. Uh, whether it be flowers from honey eaters, whether it be sap for uh, things like sugar gliders or other animals that actually get the nutrients, et cetera, out of different parts of the tree. We also talk about you know, trees as shelter. So whether it be for hollows, cracks in the, in the trunk, the bark, whether it be on the tree or whether it be starting to peel off the tree, the trunks themselves, the roots and the fallen timber that may be around the base of the tree. So, so apart from, and, and not, to, not to forget, probably the most important one, the trees along with every other plant, sequesters carbon dioxide, produces oxygen through photosynthesis so that the rest of us actually have something to breathe. So tree hollows, are probably one of the most important values of the tree. Um, Australia is slightly different to the rest of the world in this regard. Australia, New Guinea, and all areas, if you've heard of the, the geographic term Wallace's line, um, so it goes through Indonesia effectively, anything to the east and south of Wallace's line has a different um, set of fauna than everywhere else. And this has an impact on how, you know, hollows, what's available for other, our fauna to use. So for instance, this is a lace monitor. Um, our, large, our second, our largest goanna in Victoria um, and one of the largest um, animal uh, goannas in Australia. Very dependent on tree hollows for you know, laying for, for um, roosting in, for nesting in, etc. Hollows provide roosting and nesting resources for a large variety of native fauna. Now in Nilambic alone, that is around about 70 species. So we're looking at a large number of birds, uh, nearly 40 species of birds, over 20 species of mammals, um, frogs and reptiles. So from possums that we're all familiar with, to parrots, cockatoos, galahs, to goannas. So the hollow formation in Australia, I was saying about that different um, biology, Australia doesn't have what they call primary excavators. So that's animals that will go ahead and create hollows for themselves and the most Known example of this, the group of birds called woodpeckers. So they go, you know, bang, bang holes into the trees, open up the trees and start to create hollows. We don't have woodpeckers in Australia. So our hollow formation process is completely different. And it may take in some trees up to a hundred years or more for hollows to form. So those big old red gums in the Northern suburbs of Melbourne, could be, you know, 
two or 300 years old. And for the first hundred years, they don't provide a hollow at all. The older they get, the more chance of there are hollows forming. So as trees age, or as storms come past, etc., as we've seen recently, they drop their limbs and branches, which can open up the tree to fungal attack or insect attack, where you've got beetles that lay the eggs that start to and then start to live on the decaying tree matter. Fungi, fungus um, starts to, to, to grow within the tree. So here we have a bracket fungus growing on the edge of a tree. This is the fruiting body of the fungus that's actually growing with inside, inside the, that trunk of that tree. Over time, this forms hollows. You know, small hollows to start with, and then animals can excavate them further to, um, to meet their own needs. So it could be a small hollow over a period of time, and then it gets largened by, you know, animals ripping open the hollow, trying to create themselves a home. And then in turn, that might be, become more suitable for another animal to use also. So again, hollows can form in a range of different trees. This is a very large candle bark in, in my next door neighbor's um, backyard. Has a range of hollows in it. If you can follow the cursor, there's one here, there's others up the main trunk. So eucalypts, so the gum trees, the red stringy barks, the box um, that are in, you know, the red box, et cetera, that are in the Olympic, um, all, the, all the eucalypts are a common hollow former. But we've also things got, we've got things like the, the silky oak, which is native to Northern Australia, but heavily planted as an ornamental plant in our parks, gardens, backyards across the city. And then we also have exotics. Now, lots of people kind of have a bit of a thing about exotics. Elm trees, for instance, the large numbers of suburbs that have elms or plane trees, they can also form hollows over time and provide a valuable resource for the wildlife in the changed urban environment. So I'll have a look at a couple of these. So these, this is a silky oak, um, quite large silky oaks, being heavily trimmed back because of power lines overhead, etc. And when they had to be removed, they had quite substantial hollows in them. So the hollow here is approximately 30 centimetres across. Exotic trees like elms, these are in the city, um, had projects there where possums were nesting in them, rainbow lorikeets as in the picture on the left. Um, we're actually using these hollows within these exotic trees as a nesting site, as a breeding site or a roosting site, sheltering site if it was a possum. So it doesn't necessarily, the, 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 the animals aren't critical about, may not be critical about what the species of tree is, it's the fact that it's a home. It's a bit like you can live in a flat, you can live in an apartment, a townhouse, a McMansion, a single, you know, double garage, brick veneer, it doesn't matter what it is, it's a home where, you know, and the fauna find it the same. So other tree features, is, so it's not just the hollows that form potentially, you know, fauna habitat. It's things like um, peeling bark. So in this case, this managum here with large amounts of peeling bark, uh, fauna will live in that. So micro bats, et cetera, will, can live underneath the bark. Birds will nest in amongst that bark. Um, fissures, not exactly hollows, they do, however, provide roosts. Small fissures, they only have to be one, one and a half centimetres wide. And things like geckos, reptiles can get into those fissures and quite happily, that, that's their roosting spot. And things like bats can also, micro bats can also access there. You know, can get into those cracks and provide a shelter for them during the daytime. So the, the loose bark not only provides those sh nesting and sheltering spots, but they also provide invertebrates, so large numbers of spiders. If you've ever pulled off a sheet of bark off a tree and found that you've got a spider, or, or in some cases, a handful of spiders crawling up your arm, etc., you'll know invertebrates quite use those areas to shelter as well, and the birds will then use the invertebrates 
as a food source. So it's a bit like a home in a supermarket potentially all wrapped into one. So some of the alternatives, if we don't have the trees, if we're in newer suburbs and the, the existing trees are few and far between, then what are our alternatives? Over time, more and more hollows disappear from the landscape. It might be that the neighbour three doors down wants to build a house, they then apply for a permit from the council. The council gives them approval to remove a tree or two or five even uh, under certain conditions, including that they've got to you know, offset those trees maybe. But those trees are gone. They're no longer in the neighbourhood. So what we need to do is find alternatives, particularly if we want to keep the fauna in the neighbourhood and in our suburbs, um, we've got to find alternatives that they find appealing to live. Because the, the supermarket's there, the food supply is still there, it's just, you know, they need the housing as well, to put it in a um, human terms. So the easiest alternative is a nest box. Put up a nest box on the side of a tree but they're only a substitute, they're not like the real thing. They have a, generally have a much more limited time span and other issues with nest boxes that mean that they may not be used 100% of the time. So a lot of research has been undertaken into the design of nest boxes for specific species. So whether it be We'll talk about this shortly. What features of that nest box? Is it the depth of the nest box? Is it the size of the entrance hole? Is it the material that it's made out of? Is it the position that it's put in, etc.? One thing that's becoming more in, um, increasingly used is what we call chainsaw hollows as opposed to nest boxes. Pardon me. This is where arborists and other people who have developed the skills actually use chainsaws to cut into the living tree, cut a hollow out from the inside and then put a face plate on. So this diagram here, this is actually a face plate where the hollow behind it has been cut out with a chainsaw. This has been cut to fit the hollow. It's been screwed in. So these three holes here are screws where it's actually been screwed into the timber of the wood and the tree has started to heal over, over that face plate a little bit. And of course it has a hollow for the birds to come and go. This example is actually used by a white-throated tree creeper up um, near Wood End um, to breed over, over a couple of years now. So it's a quite a successful technique. It's not one that everybody can be involved in, up a ladder, on a rope, in a cherry picker with a chainsaw, it's not everybody's cup of tea, that's for sure. So some of the, some of the features of the, the nest box are things like diameter of the entrance hole. If it is too big, you're going to get maybe undesirable species from your point of view um, coming and going. So if you were trying to attract uh, small parrots or sugar gliders, you might have a smaller hollow or a smaller entrance hole rather than a larger entrance hole where possums might, a large brush hole possums might be able to come and go, etc. Uh, internal partitioning stops some species being able to use the box itself and the size of the box um, are all factors. But that said, um, size doesn't always matter and I'll show you some examples shortly. If you just remember this image here, a ringtail possum coming out of a box with a very wide front. I'll come back to that a little later. Positioning of the nest box needs to consider what fauna will, that may use it, and particularly the local weather conditions. This is one of my mates in the backyard of my house. He actually uses this box. This box doesn't have a lid on it but he uses this box regularly, uh, probably I would say 50, but at least 50% of the time. One thing about the weather, the weather conditions, as most of our bad weather, winds, rain, et cetera, comes from the south, the southwest, we don't 
want the hollow facing that direction. Otherwise, the box is going to be regularly filled with water when it rains. The other thing is, as most of the hot weather is in the north and the or the western side of uh, of our um, environment. We generally try not to position the nest boxes in those directions either because particularly in the summertime, the nest boxes may, may get too hot um, and therefore be uncomfortable for fauna and or don't get used over that period of time because they're not, they're not suitable enough for that period. Okay, so we've, we've got a, so that's a little bit of, about nest boxes and a background to nest boxes. We've got a fauna pole now that um, Kate will put up. The poll's asking you, and you can use your mouse, as Helen has said, just to click on the answers, um, what species you think might use nest boxes and hollows. Okay, so there, yourself a little time, click in any of those boxes that you wish, and then we'll have, we'll have a look at the results in a moment. So how are we going, Kate? We Okay, so results, possums, gliders, microbats, parrots, owls, reptiles, kookaburras and ducks. Practically everybody who voted said, you know, possums are the most obvious ones. I think because we probably have the most interaction with them around our homes. Um, a range of gliders, a range of microbats, parrots, see, you know, the cockatoos, the, the galahs, rosellas, et cetera, in the local parks. Ducks is an interesting one. We'll come to ducks shortly. Owls, some owls use hollows most of the time, and a lot of the time, some only use them for breeding. And that's... <coughs> and then we've got reptiles, I said kookaburras. Okay, so let's have a look at some of the whole using fauna um, based on what we've just been talking about, based on the poll. These will all be familiar to you. So first of all, we've got um, some of the ducks. So chestnut teal, um, black duck, wood duck, Australian wood duck, all use hollows. Now, the, tr the candle bark that I showed earlier in the backyard of my next door neighbor's place has had wood ducks nesting in that tree off and on for a number of years. Our nearest wetland is at least a kilometre away. So the ducks find somewhere to nest that suits them and then they work about getting their young to the water or wherever they need them to be at the end of the day. So here's just a little bit of video for cuteness sake and uh, I'd like to um, thank Alice for um, providing the video for us to use. So this goes for about approximately two minutes. This nest box is five meters in the air um, and the video has been constructed from two different cameras, one, of, one looking at the nest box and one on the ground.
So you can see here, mum's flown out. She's now calling the ducklings out of the box. So once all the ducklings are actually on the ground, um, dad comes along to, to join them and then they're heading off to wherever. Did you notice at the end where the, all the ducklings were there, one appeared from the left-hand side. So obviously that one had had a much bigger jump than the rest. But the interesting thing is that the ducklings actually bounce very well. They're small, lightweight, fluffy, but have amazing capacity to, to jump five meters or more, um, hit the ground and get up and be ready to uh, move off as soon as they've finished. So the next group of birds are the parrots that we're looking at. So crimson and eastern rosellas, a, a common feature um, in many backyards in many local areas in the outer suburbs. So this is the crimson rosella, hence the name. And this is the Eastern Rosella. And I often refer to this when I'm talking to kids, especially as the sauce bottle Rosella. So if you know, if you know of Rosella sauce, um, this is the bird that is the icon of that product. Both medium sized parrots um, that will um, quite happily nest in boxes and in hollows. Rainbow lorikeets, one of four species of lorikeets that are in Nilambic. So you've got the rainbow, you've got the musk, a bit of a, a bandit with a red bandana look about him. Her, uh, you also have the little lorikeet and the purple crown lorikeet. So those four species of lorikeets have been recorded within Nilambic, all requiring hollows of some sort. Sulfur crested cockatoos, we're all pretty familiar with. And galahs, again, larger cockatoo, cockatoos, larger parrots require slightly bigger hollows. Um, and then again, things like yellowtail black cockatoos um, require a much bigger hollow again. So these trees, so this formation of hollows over time might be suitable for a small parrot or a medium sized parrot. And then over time with a bit more work, and if the cockatoos or things are interested in it, they'll open it up a bit more till it becomes a, you know, suitable for other, other species to use. So it's an ongoing process. It's not just one, one size fits all. Kookaburras um, do, again require hollows. This hollow was only a couple of meters off the ground and the parents would actually fly down and up into this hollow. The hollow itself is actually facing the ground. So parents were flying down and up into the hollow as they were coming to feed. And what's being shown here is the, young, the kookaburras have this behavioral adaptation of backing themselves up to the edge of the nest and defecating outside of the nest. So they, they effectively taught to, to you know, defecate from the nest rather than defecate in the nest itself. Kookaburras don't only eat snakes, they also in this case eat cicadas. So this was one of the adult kookaburras flying up into that nest to provide um, you know, the young, young kookaburras with food. And it doesn't have to be an, a hollow that's standing in a tree, etc. It could be one on the ground. This is a tree. Um, a tree hollow branch, fallen log, literally on the ground. This hollow in the middle here um, had a had a striated pardite. This striated pardite and its partner coming and going out of that hollow. These birds will also nest in the sides of uh, um, 
road cuttings, uh, nesting gardens in a retaining wall or a rock wall or even on a building site in a pile of sand that might have been put down and the, and the brickies have gone on leave for, you know, for Christmas time, they often will often burrow into the, the, uh, the pile of sand, create a hollow. So when, they, when the guys come back to work in January, there's this bird flying in and out, carrying on if they get too close. Quite an adaptable species, but one, again, that uses a hollow to, um, so it doesn't have to be on the, in the tree itself. So these two, so powerful owl is our largest owl in Australia and one of the largest owls in the world. Um, require a, a much larger hollow. This is a bird that is approximately 60 centimetres, so two feet in the old language in size. The bigger the bird, generally the bigger the hollow. They have been known to nest in, use nest boxes in um, around Blackburn Lake Sanctuary on one occasion, but the nest box was quite a large box. It wasn't a, a normal box like what we'd be using for any of the other, any of the other um, parrots in particular or birds in particular. A barking owls also, also in the neighbourhood uh, up around Hurstbridge area. These guys have got that uh, woof, 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 type call about them. People often think they're the dog next door or up the road, but in fact, they're one of our large predatory owls. Again, hollow nester requiring large hollows in, in trees. And then we've got the smallest of our night birds. So this is an Australian owl at nightjar. It is probably about the size that it appears on the, as it appears on the screen. Not, not very large at all. Uh, it's not an owl, it's not a frog mouth. It's its own um, family even apart outside of the others, but it's a hollow nest. Often sleeps right at the very front of the hollow and just opens up its eyes just to check out what's going on and then goes back to sleep. We'll talk more about the owl at night jar later. A bird that's not often seen, but is heard from time to time if you know what to listen for. Then you've got sugar gliders. So you've got sugar gliders, um, have the habit of feeding on the sap. They bite open the bark of wattle trees and of eucalypt trees, along with the other gliders, a uh, yellow belly glider, for instance, and feed on the sap. So as the sap starts to run out, out of the cuts, um, they lap it up. And then when they're finished, they, fly, they glide off and then they come back the next night and open it up again with quite sharp teeth for a, for a sap eating insectivorous pollen, nectar feeding um, animal that's got very sharp teeth. Um, so they bite that sap, bite that bark open again, make it bleed again. They also build a nest, as seen in this one, this is actually an artificial hollow. So it's an old a part of a tree that's had a bottom put on it, uh, an old hollow that's had a bottom put on it. They also create a nest of generally fresh green gum leaves. That's one of the, one of the um, indicators of what species might actually be using a nest box at the time. And then you've got your brush-tailed possum, probably loved by some, the bane of, bane of existence by others, particularly if they get up into your roof, um, leave behind your cupboards. We've had an experience of actually leaving behind our pantry cupboards at one stage. Um, the box on the left hand side was a small box, had no lid. The possum, the female possum had a joey in the box. She was cramming herself into the box every night to the point where the joey was big enough that she actually had to sleep with her arms and her head outside of the box. So it was pretty much like this every night or every day, she was hanging, sleeping with her arms and head outside of the box. Um, I felt I took pity on them, so I made that other box that was seen earlier that had the ringtail possum coming out of it. A bigger box, more area so she could come and go. They, ne they never used the box, but the ringtails used the box instead. So individual circumstances, you can create a box for one, but doesn't mean to say they're necessarily going to use it. Ringtail possums, uh, again, 
probably the, the cuter relative of the, of the brush-tailed possum. Often see them crawling along the power lines of a night, along the back fence potentially, across the road in some cases. They will build a dray. So this is a large stick type nest called a dray. Um, they will create a dray, but they'll also quite happily live in a hollow or an nest box, depending on what's available. So the dray is just made out of vegetation, leaves, twigs, etc. They have a hole going in and out where they might line with some leaves, and and that's one of their um, their housing choices. Um, but they said they will quite happily use a nest box or a uh, or a hollow, a naturally occurring hollow as well. So the microbats. Now we're talking about micro. When talking about microbats and bats, and then we're not talking about the big flying foxes um, that hang around uh, Kew, for instance. They're actually quite happy. They roost in the trees. These little microbats. Some of them are the size of a, a weight of a ten cent piece or less. So the most common microbat we'd have probably around the suburbs would be the Gould's wattle bat named after John Gould, the, uh, the early naturalist. Uh, they have, they're two tones. They have a dark colored head and a light colored body, a lighter brown colored body. That's Gould's wattled, wattled bat. We also have the lesser long-eared bat. Now, one word of note here, this is a, is a bat in my hands. I have had um, the rabies shots because there is the potential for some microbats to carry Australian bat lisa virus, which is in the rabies complex. Um, wildlife handlers, zoologists, people doing research with bats, etc., cetera, um, have, get, get their rabies shots and then have regular checks and updates, boosters, etc. Otherwise, um, if that wasn't the circumstance, um, the obvious way to get around it would be actually to be wearing gloves. So I prefer to wear gloves these days rather than bare hands. But this is a photo that just shows the what I'm wanting to talk about with this animal. So less along in bat, quite large ears, a bat that's probably eight to 10 grams, um, relatively slow moving, feeds on copious amounts of insects, moths, mosquitoes, etc. Um, every night. A, a fantastic thing to have in the neighbourhood um, to clear off, particularly during mosquito season especially, um, the amount of weight that they consume each night, all these microbats consume each night in terms of um, insects um, is nearly up, can be up to 50% of their body weight. So this is the smallest Australian bat. This is a little forest bat. Now, if you put your thumb out and then you measure between your knuckle and your tip of your thumb, that's about the size of the body of the little forest bat. And it weighs about, it weighs less than a 10 cent piece, or as I, when talking to kids, two pieces of chewing gum. That's roughly its weight. So about three to four grams. The next one is um, the white striped freetail bat. This is our largest bat that we hear, that we have in uh, Victoria, pretty much. And it's the one that most, a lot of people can hear anyway, as it's flying around of a night, it's using its, its calling. So it's, it's got a call like a And it sounds like an insect, but if you're good enough, quick enough with a torch, uh, you can actually see these bats flying over over the tops of trees and around parks, near uh, streetlights, etc. Some people, you know, people who are under 50 can hear them. Some people over 50 can hear them. But those people, as you get older and you lose some of your hearing range, um, you 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 miss these species. These species call within the audible range of humans. Um, but I said, depending on your age, you may be able to hear them, you may not be able to hear them. All of these guys live in hollows. Some of them live in, in groups. Some of them live singularly. So there might be a, a roost of 20, 30 bats or even more, or some of them might just choose to live by themselves. Brush-tailed fascigale, um, a 
an icon of Nilambik uh, in the box in the in the box forest around Nilambik is a carnivorous marsupial um, feeding on it will feed on um, reptiles it will feed on insects it will feed on other small mammals if it can get up onto them um, a fantastic little species lots of character charisma and um, generally often punch above their weight in terms of what they eat um, not being afraid to take on you know prey almost their own size And I'd like to thank Tim Borden for the photo. Um, but one of, the, one of the characteristics that they've got is that in their nest box, they're not particularly clean. So this is the area that it's nestled into, and this is its latrine. So here's all its scats in the same box. Many animals won't defecate in the box that they use. Fascigales will. And in that is actually a good indicator if, while you're checking your nest boxes, um, what type of fauna might be using the box. So if it's got lots of green, fresh green leaves, it might be a sugar glider. If it's got scats and feathers and things like that, chances are it's a fascigale. Now we talked about earlier about the petition in the box. This is to stop other animals getting in. The holes at the bottom, the animal comes in through the hole, up the petition and then into the nest part at the back. So it stops other animals using the box. So it's only particularly the faster gales and sugar gliders that use this type of box. This will be familiar to all of you who, who registered. This is a group of sugar gliders in a nest box up um, behind uh, Rushworth. Here we go. Um, some of the issues with the nest boxes is that they don't have the same insulation properties as a tree. So they may not be used throughout the year. If it's too hot in the box, it won't get used. If it's too cold in the box, it won't get used. And we, um, the Field Naturalist Club of Victoria and Blackburn have got uh, approximately a over 100 uh, nest boxes up behind Rushworth. And we've been finding that at different times of the year when we go up and survey check the boxes and we'll get different results depending on when the year is. So if it's around Christmas time, we won't get a lot of animals. If it's around May, we might get 60, 70, 100 animals. Christmas time, we might get 20 or 30. And because of the, we believe it's because of the heat. So the temperature um, of the environment impacting on the temperature inside the box. Some nest boxes are especially used for birds, such as parrots and ducks, will only get used during the breeding season. They don't need um, the um, box at other times. Owls, etc., will use the box right throughout the whole year. Use the hollow, use the box. That's where they roost in. Um, and and owl at night jars, especially, will use hollows and nest boxes the whole year through. So some, some of the materials that you might use for um, nest boxes. So due to the thermal properties you know, of the timber, timber should only be about 15 mil or thicker. Um, any less than that, you said the box can get too hot, too cold, and may only be used part of the year. Where if your desire is to provide you know, a habitat, a, a box that can be used across the year, um, to only have it used part of the year, it's it's um, not as good as it, it could be, not as effective as it could be. Marine ply, um, so you can get like 18, marine, 18 mil marine ply from the, um, the hardware store. Uh, form ply is, is this material here that's used for forming concrete, um, boxing, et cetera. That can be used, and I use that on the top and the bottom because, it, because of its waterproof qualities, or hardwood. Um, Slabs of hardwood are the best. But whatever it's got to be, remember it's going out in the environment, it's got to have some um, amount of waterproofing um, ability to, uh, to withstand heat, cold, wet, um, frosty even. 
a range of conditions. Try to use recycled materials as much as possible. So either at the secondhand timber yard or if you go into the hardware store starting with B, um, they often have a scrap, scrap timber box. Pick out scraps, some of the scraps can be 50 cents, a dollar, two dollars. Um, it saves buying brand new material. Screws, hinges, etc. obviously, um, wherever possible, uh, should be galvanized or especially for outdoor use. Um, no point using uh, screws or hinges that are gonna rust quickly or that are designed for holding up your cabinets inside. It's not gonna work because of those that environmental conditions, the wet, the dry, the heat, etc. This is what, and what we try to do um, is, is use resources wherever we can. Got a little video here and I'll go through it with you as we, um, I'll talk you through it as we look at it. So in our job as consultants, we often get called out to do fauna salvaging when trees are removed. So trees providing the hollows, if there's hollows in the trees, we salvage them rather than having them go through the chipper. So it might have large hollows, might have small hollows. So we chip them out, we use a chisel, etc., hollow them out wherever possible. So this one's been hollowed out, it's got a bolt put in, it's got a partition put in it. We put a top and a bottom on it. We put an entrance hole, depending on what the fauna is that we're trying to do. So if it's a, a um, if it's a sugar glider, we might only put like a, a 30 mil hole. If it's a parrot, we might put a 50, a 70, 80 mil hole, etc. So depending on what the boxes are, um, what the purpose of the boxes are, depending on what size hole we're putting in. So these boxes here, so out of that um, initial log that was lying on the, on the ground there, that was about two and a half metres long. We managed to get, um, we managed to get seven uh, hollows out of that. So you can see these have all got different hollows. A large open hollow, another dead, uh, using the dead branches, a hollow, formed hollows through here. And these are all the boxes that went up in the Woodridge Linear Reserve. So what we've been doing with the Friends of, of Woodridge Linear Reserve, um, these all went up in the reserve about four months ago. This little one here is with a, with a spout is, is particularly for a pardalite. So the pardalite uses that entrance hole into the box itself. So paint can be used paint or uh, it can be used to provide additional waterproofing. And when we're using the form pie for a, for a lid and a base, we paint the edge of the cut edge of the form pie to, to give it that little bit of extra waterproofing benefit. Um, you can also use a, um, a, timber, a timber oil type thing to, to increase the life. One thing about painting is some added benefits to painting nest boxes and we'll, we'll a little bit further on, we'll talk about what those benefits are. So construction and installation of the box. So you can actually purchase nest boxes as kits from um, Matrobe University Wildlife Sanctuary. Have a, you know, you can go and pick them up as a, as a uh, constructed item. You can buy them as a kit and they'll send them out to you uh, and you put it together yourself. So. You, so that's one option. Um, <coughs> patterns are available online or from books like, like these. So nest box books by the Gould League or nest boxes for wildlife. Um, if you get on to Google or whatever search engine you use and type in nest box patterns or et cetera, there's a whole range of resources out there that you can um, use and a bit of it's trial and error for what may actually work in, in your backyard, in your area. Um, but it's something particularly at the moment when we're still in relative lockdown, um, something that could become a project over the, over the holidays, particularly if we're not allowed to travel too far. Other things to take into account, 
you're dealing with power tools. So you might be using a drop saw or similar, a, a circular saw or jigsaw to, to cut out the pattern, to cut out the entrance holes. You're using um, cordless drills maybe to put the screws in. Um, all those things have got to be taken in, in, into consideration. Uh, for instance, while you're putting the screws in, wear some safety goggles. The screw bounces out. Um, the last thing you want is to actually, you know, get injured by that. And, and even during installation, you're putting the boxes up. One thing, you might be using a ladder. Make sure the ladder's attached to the tree. A number of people I know have climbed the ladder, gone to one arm with the drill, one arm holding the box, and have slipped off. The ladder's slipped. They've fallen off. They've injured themselves. Um, in some cases, quite severely. Um, so try and reduce the amount of risk. Um, so attach the ladder so it doesn't slide off the tree. One other thing in terms of installation um, is your backyard is one thing, but if you want to, you know, put up nest boxes in the reserve next door or or on somebody else's place. Always seek permission from whoever manages the, the, the property, owns the land before you go putting them up because they may have a whole range of different uh, concerns. Um, so you got a nice nil and big reserve next door, you want to put some nest boxes up, check with the council first, rather than just think, yes, it's a great idea, but just go ahead and do it. There's, there are other, con other considerations as well. So once your nest box is up, the next thing, it's not a set and forget. It's a bit like a water, it's a bit like a, a bird bath. You don't fill it up with water once and then never fill it up again. Uh, you're putting up a box for a particular reason. Make sure that reason is what uh, the box is being used for. So the monitoring of the box and regularly might say, you know, once every three months maybe. Um, can be rewarding, but it's also necessary, necessary to achieve whatever aims you have. I want to encourage some local fauna to nest in my backyard. If that's your aim, then you make sure that it's only the local fauna that are using it, rather than a whole range of other things. As a hot tree hollows, next boxes can also provide homes for feral species such as the common miner or the Indian miner, as it used to be called, and feral honeybees. Um, would not be the first time being out looking at nest boxes and there's, there's a bee, an active beehive in the nest box. So when monitoring nest box, the first priority is actually the fauna that may be in the box. So you're doing things carefully, you're considering about um, what time, what's the best time to check? How do I go about checking it? Where do I put the ladder when I'm climbing up the box? If you're looking at a box and you've got a lid on the box, there's no point putting the ladder right beside the box. So when you lift up the lid, the animal can't get out the entrance hole because you're there. And the only other option is what's coming out at your face. Um, put the ladder on the side and then climb up, open the lid. So the animal's got at least one other option apart from coming straight up at you. Uh, one other option of getting out of the box if it's disturbed. And the rewards can be wonderful. This little snapshot of cuteness um, is a nest box. Again, there's the petition. There's the entrance hollow down the bottom. So the, the, the sugar gliders come in the bottom over the petition. And this count was at least nine sugar gliders. And I'm saying at least nine. We didn't pull them all out and count them. We can't, simply counted the tails and divided by, uh, counted the tails. Or we counted the heads, or we come up with a combination of both there could have been many more sugar gliders in that box. And I've heard of stories of having 14 sugar gliders in one box. So pretty spectacular when you lift the lid and that's what you're looking at. It's definitely well worthwhile. So methods for monitoring your box could simply be, could be as simple as using a pair of binoculars to just observe what might be coming and going from the nest box. Non-intrusive, you're just observing what's happening. Secondly, looking for marks on the edge of a nest box. If it's painted, this is where we were talking before about the benefits of painting. If it's painted and animals are starting to come and go from your nest box, this is what you might find. 
you might find that the paint's being chipped off around the edge. Revealing fresh timber gives you an indication that something might be using it. Or another indication that something might be using it is, is the next step, and thank, thanks to Jan David for these, is actually the whole side of the next box has been eaten out. So something obviously wants to use that box for their purposes. So they've just created a hole of their own. Not happy with the one that's there, we'll build another one. You can use a webcam. Sometimes you can get webcam kits that you can mount in the lid. Uh, and that's probably good for school groups, etc. You want to monitor what might be in your nest box. Get a couple of little webcam kits, mount them up in the lid, use them, use them through the Wi-Fi system, and you can check on the activity in the box. You might use a pole-mounted camera, something like this, where the, the camera actually goes into the hollow and observes what might be in the hollow. Or you may use a physical inspection. So actually climbing the ladder, checking out the hollow, what's in it, can't you, you know, coming from the side rather than coming from the front. So the, if there's animals there, they can come out the entrance hollow here or they can escape. They've got two ways of getting out of the box. A couple of next bits of footage is just checking out now, kind of cheating in the next two bits of footage. We're actually using an elevated work platform or a cherry picker to check some nest boxes. So those nest boxes were part of a project um, set up for, for possums, quite a large entrance hollow, uh, set up for brush-tailed possums um, to, to use the boxes rather than use other resources that were around at the time. So that's, I said that's kind of cheating because you're actually using a, a cherry picker to do that, much easier to get up in and out of, but then it require, that requires its own, um, you know, let me just, that requires its own uh, issues such as having you know, access to a cherry picker, etc. This is another one, similar story, checking a, a uh, they were constructed boxes. This is using a natural hollow box. Okay, so, in this box, obviously there was nothing living in the box at the time, but what we have in the box is a number of possum scats, so brush tailed possum scats, um, so that we know that the box has been occupied at some stage by a possum. Um, one thing you'll notice here, this is a, a cuphead um, bolt. It is, um, the cup heads on the inside and the rest of the bolts on the outside. So this is the attachment mechanism. So it attaches the, the hollow to a, a, a box mount, which then gets attached to a tree. You might have noted before in that sugar guide photo, the bolt was actually sticking into the, into the box and the nut was on the inside. I have issues with that be, be, simply because it's an extra piece of metal that's sticking out into a box. So I prefer to turn the arrangement around the other way and just have a smooth cup head on the inside um, that has less impact on the fauna or potentially less impact on the fauna. Okay, so two of the things we're looking out for, common miners, um, as we showed before, the, the brown, the black, the yellow legs, uh, they're an introduced species. They are, hollow nesters and their aggressive hollow nesters, if they want to hollow, they will fight with the inhabitants until the inhabitants give up and go somewhere else. So in terms of their nests, so if you've got a nest box and you're looking in it and it's got bits of litter, like bits of plastic, uh, plastic wrappers, it's got uh, pieces of ribbon, it's got all sorts of um, rubbish and trash, um, it's most likely going to be a common miner nest box. And, it, and common miners also have blue eggs, unlike most, unlike all native species which have white eggs. So what to do in that situation? Remove the nest, plug up the hole, 
um, and allow them to go and find somewhere else to live. Um, after a period of time, you can then, you know, a month or so, unplug the hole and hopefully um, the native fauna will, will, it'll be available for native fauna. Honeybees, um, another significant issue in our nest boxes. So under the Victorian Flora and Fauna Guarantee Act, honeybee use of nesting hollows is a threatening process. So it's recognised by the Victorian government that feral bees, pardon me, using tree hollows or um, hollow uh, nesting hollows, nesting boxes, is a threatening process that is potentially leading to the um, animals, fauna that use those hollows becoming vulnerable, endangered, etc. So that's a formal recognition of the impact of honeybees. So if you find that you've got honeybees in your nest box, contact a local apiarist and ask them to come and remove them. Clean out the, clean out the box once removed and hopefully, for, you know, hopefully other native animals will move in. Now, these two photos, this, this is just not an Australian issue, a Victorian issue. These two photos are actually, one was in a park in Orlando, Florida, in a, in a suburban botanic gardens. And this is an example, again, in Florida, of a bee swarm on a naturally occurring hollow. So there's two hollows that have been taken out of use by, by bees. And bees will get quite aggressive. Um, also, if you go to, you know, to do it yourself, as a, hence my suggestion of uh, getting an apiarist to do it. And so here's some hollows in place. So some of the hollows we've created, this one's got a couple of uh, ringtail possums tucked up in there. This is in a lady's backyard in um, Mitcham. This is a bat box that we've attached in the Woodridge Linear Reserve. So it's only got a little slit under the base there where the cursor is. Um, the bats fly in to land on here, climb up into the box. And that's where the roost. And when they, when they come out of a the night, they came down here and then they drop off. They drop off and off they go. And this is a possum box, another box that we put up in the linear, Woodridge Linear Reserve. Um, as part of that nest box program. We went and checked these boxes about a week ago. This box had a owl at night jar. So that's the smallest one we talked, the smallest nocturnal bird we talked about earlier. It was quite happily living there until I stuck my buff head in and it decided it was coming out. It then went and flew to another nest box or another hollow in a tree about uh, 25 metres away from this box. Um, but yeah, it was good to see that only in a, in a period of a, of a few months um, that the boxes were already starting to get some fauna in them. <coughs> and I think, um, yeah, so that, so if you've got any queries of us, um, there's an email there, you can, you can contact us. But Kate and Helen, that's the end of the presentation. I see we've got quite a few questions. Okay, so are we happy to go through some of those questions? Yeah, sure, John. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can, yes. Fantastic. Um, so, Kate, are you there? You might have to help me a bit. We've just had, well, the one that's just come in is how do you attach the box to the tree? Yep. Okay, so one, there's a couple, there's, there's a number of different techniques you can use, and depending on what you've got, um, the simplest technique is a couple of um, blind hooks screwed into the side of the box and then use wire um, around the tree. The problem with that is if it's left too long, the wire starts to cut into the, into the trunk of the tree itself. So use an old garden hose. So put the wire through an old garden hose. The garden hose just gives it a bit of padding. Um, other techniques is you can get like, um, Piano springs type thing, springs that can use it and that allows the, as the tree grows a bit, the spring has a bit of a, um, 
a bit of give in it. I prefer to use to actually screw either large um, 90 mil wood screws, uh, treated pine screws or something into the, directly into the trunk, or if it's a bigger box that requires a bit more weight, then using a um, coach bolts that you can actually use a, a socket set, ratchet socket set type thing to actually screw into the tree to it. So it attaches this to the tree. What I do allow for though, is put some rubber grommets behind the head of the bolt. So that when it, when it goes in, um, the bolt isn't all the way in. So it does, the grommets will allow some movement as the tree grows, um, some movement of the box. So otherwise, if you put them all in tight, flush tight in, um, the box is there and then as the tree grows, it's impacting on the timber that's holding the box to the tree, etc. So there's, there's a number of different ways. It depends on what you're most comfortable with, but whichever way you do it, you have to keep an eye on that as well because that's something else that needs to be monitored so the box doesn't fall off or it doesn't impact on the tree. John, Shelley asked, um, where do you think the sugar gliders are going in the summer? Um, in up in, in the Gamby, uh, Rushworth, we believe that they're possibly going to other, to more natural um, hollows. And, and then during the winter time, when the populations have expanded after the breeding season, et cetera, take, potentially taking up um, the use of the nest boxes again. Something we haven't been able to track because obviously we don't put radio trackers on them and track them all year round. It's more a, a monitoring pro and providing habitat for um, the fauna in the box ironbark in the box ironbark forest that, where the trees aren't generally big enough to have their own hollows. John Colleen asked about the goannas in Nillimbik and where you might be able to see them. Um, goannas, is, there is a few records of goannas from Nillimbik, but they're probably going to be the furthest to the furthest northeast. Um, of, of the of the uh, local government uh, of, of the Shire, um, won't be a there won't be a lot of them. They they can be fairly elusive in where, anywhere, even where they're common, unless it's around a picnic ground and people they've got used to people actually feeding them, uh, and then they'll hang around often. But um, lace monitors can be fairly elusive, even in areas where um, they're relatively common. Uh, so they're not something that may be seen. But I'd say to the more northeast of the uh, of the Shire. Kimberly asked, what is the optimal direction to place the boxes? Uh, opti optimal direction, so the hollow generally facing east. So um, depending on where the hollow is uh, on the box, um, face the hollow to the east um, wherever possible. Uh, so when you're designing a box, keep that in mind that you want the hollow to the east. So if you've got a box on the left hand, if you've got a hollow on the left hand side, to face that hollow to the east means you have to have the box on the north side of the tree. That's not ideal. So you might put the hollow on, um, turn the box sideways so that the box has the hollow generally facing, facing southeast to northeast is probably the best. And use the tree to provide some shelter from the weather or from the heat in the afternoon. Just to add to that one, um, Ian Parsons asked, have there been studies to test if a nest box mounted at a 45 degree angle diagonally improves or reduces uptake by avian species? He says, um, other techs and galahs use the ends of branches that would have a diagonal hollow rather than the vertical position of nest boxes. Yeah, I, you know, I, I find if I'm mounting a hollow for that are primarily designed for birds, I'll always put them on a, on a side, uh, on an angle. Um, I find that that's easier for the birds to come and go. There is some nest box designs that you'll talk about putting wire on the inside of the, attaching wire on the inside of the box so that the animals can climb up the wire. I have really serious concerns for that. And if the wire happened, if the staples or whatever you use happen to come out and the wire's hanging there, you've got a sugar glider that gets caught in the wire, gets its membranes caught in the wire, it's not going to be going anywhere in a hurry. Um, so I try and mount the boxes, yep, preferably on a 45 degree angle. I don't know of any studies that have looked at the orientation of the box compared um, 
to work out whether that's a benefit um, or whether a straight box is okay. Lots of people would say mount them straight up and down. Um, my personal preference is on a side angle or up to a 45 degree angle to allow the animals to walk in and out rather than get to the hollow and then drop in or try and fly up to get out. Here's an interesting one. Uh, with the kookaburra defecating, would that be a telltale sign that the hollow is being used specifically by a kookaburra? Um, with the potential of the whitewash around the base, of, around a hollow at the bottom of a tree could very well be, yes. Um, a lot of the birds, so the birds of prey, the owls and things that, that live on, um, obviously have bone, because owls often eat, owls and kookaburras will eat um, many of their prey whole, or at least dissect it into quite large bits. Um, they have a whitewash, because of the, the calcium in the, in the bones, etc., goes through the, the system. So often it's a, the, is a white powdery color on the ground. Yes, that would potentially be an, an issue that says that they are actually, that it could be a kookaburra. It could also be um, one of the owl species. Um, Sue asked, is the height of the box important? Some of the, some of the um, fauna, will use a box a lot higher than others. So a kookaburra, for instance, you might be mounting a box at about five metres. Um, lots of other birds are happy to have a box ceiling height. So three metres off the top end of an ordinary ladder, uh, about three metres for, for humans, because uh, there's, there's occupational health and safety issues about going above three metres anyway, uh, in terms of um, workplace health and safety. But three metres is an approximately decent height. Um, micro bats like an open flyway, so somewhere where they can come and go quite easily. Other animals um, are happy to have vegetation around so they can fly into one and then fly into the hollow or come in. <coughs> um, for instance, ducks on a, a box mounted on a pine post might only need to be a metre and a half to two metres off the ground um, for the ducks to use it, depending on what the species is. Um, Kim asked, should the entrance orientation follow the same rules away from the weather for bat boxes? Um, yes, I think that it's probably the best, because um, a bat box, the little natural one that I showed towards the end there, um, it's just a little hollow about yay big. Um, bat boxes themselves can have a an internal partition where the bats fly in and then they hang off the walls of the, inter of the box on the inside. If the orientation of the, the entrance hole as the hole faces down is not so bad, but if, you fa if you've got it facing to the south side of a tree, you've got, the we you've got much more weather impact. Uh, so um, chances are it may not be used as often because obviously if you've got rain coming in and the, and the winds, etc. whereas if you turn it to the east side of the tree, um, that the tree helps to protect the box from those elements. So while the hollow is facing down, the position of the box may be more important than um, the actual direction that the hollow faces. Can I just ask you about the box that um, you were going, I might have missed it answering questions. Did you hold up the two books that you were going to show people? Because someone's asking about guides. So one's a, this one's a Gould Lead Nest Box book. Um, I believe it is still available. If you Google it online, you can probably either pick it up from a supplier or maybe even find it secondhand. This one is one called Nest Boxes for Wildlife. A practical guide. There is also other um, documents. There's one by the Greater Land Services of Sydney um, that talks about a number of different um, nest boxes. There is one, well, Frankston Council is going to have one shortly because I've just uh, completed that one for them. Um, looking at nest boxes for, for fauna that are relevant to, to Melbourne, et cetera. Um, the best suggestion is to just get on to your search engine, whatever it be, type in nest box designs, um, and then there's a whole range of designs and there's, there's Facebook pages. 
Uh, in fact, a duck video from Alice. She has a, a Facebook page called Nestbox Tales. Um, so, yep, yeah, okay, so somebody's just posted a, a comment then about a, 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 a link to a page. Um, so there's a number of different resources you can look at um, in terms of where you might get some more information, where you can get some designs, etc. Um. Okay, um, there was just one from Zoe, sorry. Um, she says she might have missed it, but was the owl at Nightjar the only thing you found so far in the Woodridge boxes? Yes, owl at Nightjar is the only, is the only thing we, it was actually, I was quite surprised because I was expecting probably uh, a possum or two uh, in some of those boxes. And we know from doing elf and copper butterfly caterpillar counts in Pauline Tona Reserve, that there are sugar gliders in the area. Um, so to actually get an owl at night jar was um, unusual. It was, a, it, was a, it was a very nice surprise to poke and go, oh, hello. Um, we've got something that wasn't expected, but that's the only thing that we've found so far. Yes, so the boxes have only been up, got put up in early February. So there's been you know, only a, a couple months of settling in, but to have something so well, I think is, is, is good, is promising for the future. Uh, and the only one I can see is about whether you've put any chainsaw hollows up at Rushworth to see if they've been used. No, we haven't. No, we haven't done done any chainsaw hollows. There's um, a couple of people. I think William Terry from Macedon Ranges Council has done some chainsaw hollowing for um, different species. And I think he's researching brush-tailed fasca gales for a PhD at the moment. Um, we don't have the skills to do that. Um, and the Nestbox program that we've been doing has been going for about 30 odd years. There was a paper put out by Phoebe Massack, M-A-C-A-K from Arthur Ryler Institute, which is DELP uh, research arm recently looking at um, different Nestbox programs that have been happening across the years and, and what they've found. So that was an interesting interesting uh, an, an interesting research paper effectively combining lots of information but we haven't had the opportunity to um, um, haven't had the opportunity to go down that track no Just to add, you have put 10 chainsaw hollows in the Panton Hill reserves okay um, so we've got 10 and we've been monitoring them um, so far we've had um, signs of fasca gales so it's been really interesting because they've been leaving scats in them um, and we've had sugar glider but um, they're only relatively new and so we still haven't had them actually taking up nests but they're certainly visiting them and leaving scats in them. Yeah so so the faster gales will move or they have a the faster gales themselves have a territory so they'll move around and a lot of animals have a territory so not every animal that lives in a nest, so like possums and fasting gales and things like that, they might have two or three nesting sites or more. Um, Ring-tailed possums often have half a dozen relatively close by that they move from from time to time. And we think and the, sort of part of that reason is A, to get, you know, from predators to not get used to going, okay, they're coming and going from that every night. So they move around a bit to break up that also to, um, potentially limit the parasites that may be existing in the hollows so or in the nest so they move on the parasites that are actually in the nest you know effectively die if they've got no food supply over a period of time but yeah so you might find that the the faster gales the sugar gliders are moving around to you know in their in their environment and if they know that they're there if they've been leaving scats and stuff behind they definitely know that they're there so it's you know, a matter of, you know, potentially a matter of time, you know, just before they actually, when they're doing their monitoring, that they'll actually find them in there. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, thank you for all the questions. Um, so, um, can I just say, John, thanks so much. That was really, really interesting. And, um, for those of you who are still listening, just we do have um, a brush-tailed project, a brush-tailed fasca gale, sorry, project coming up. 
and um, we are going to provide and install three nest boxes across eight properties. So if your property occurs in both Neil and Vic Shire and the Menzies electorate, you might be eligible to be involved in the project. So if you're interested, there is a question in the post event survey, which Kate's going to be sending out to all of you, and you can indicate your interest. Uh, but on that note, I think we say thank you to everybody for being involved. Thanks so much, John. Just so much wisdom there. Really, really helpful. We really appreciate it. And thanks everyone for being so um, involved in the chats as well. That was really fabulous. No worries. Thank you. Have a good thank night, everybody. You. Good luck. Hope to see you all at another event. Thanks so much. Yeah. Bye. Bye-bye. <clears throat>